I'm Helen Hokinson. I am a reference librarian at Johnson County Library here to welcome you today to In Conversation with Diana Gesch and Ryan Bernston. Diana Gesch is a poet and essayist, the author of eight collections of poems, the Life and Transition blog at the American Scholar, and the acclaimed memoir, This Body I Wore. Her work has appeared in The New Yorker, Poetry, The Iowa Review, The Los Angeles Times, The Washington Post, Best American Poetry, and the Pushcart Prize Anthology. She is the recipient of fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts, the New York Foundation for the Arts, and the New School, where she served as the Grace Paley Teaching Fellow. For 21 years, Gesh was a New York City public school teacher at Stuyvesant, I know I pronounced that incorrectly again, um, Stuyvesant High School and, a, and at Passages Academy in the Bronx, where she ran a creative writing program for incarcerated teens. Ryan Bernston is a graduate of Northwestern University and Oxford's Creative Writing Master's Program. He is the author of 50 States of Mind, A Journey to Rediscover American Democracy. In addition to working as a food writing contributor for The Infatuation, Ryan has written for The Fulcrum, The Oxford Political Review, USA Today, and The Trevor Project, where he is the senior managing editor. Ryan is an award-winning playwright whose plays have been performed across the US and UK. You may have seen him on stage at the Unicorn Theater in The Inheritance or chatting with Her Helen Mirren as a Slytherin contestant on Harry Potter Hogwarts Tournament of Houses on HBO Max. Stuart Hines serves as the curator of special collections and archives at the Miller Nichols Library of the University of Missouri, Kansas City, and has been a Casey focused archivist and librarian for nearly three decades. In 2009, he co founded the Gay and Lesbian Archive of Mid America a collecting initiative that preserves and make accessible the histories of Kansas City's LGBTQ communities. An adjunct instructor for the UMKC History Department and the Kansas City Art Institute, he is a frequent presenter of LGBTQ history for a wide selection of community groups. In this body I wore, Diana Gesch recounts her late in life gender transition Ryan Bernstein's 50 States of Mind chronicles the author's journey through America with an aim to discover if it really is divided. Today, with moderator Stuart Hines, we'll explore how Gesh and Bernstein approached writing about personal stories and explorations of democracy. So welcome, everyone. It's good to be here. Thank you, Helen. Thank you as well, Helen. Thank you, Thank Helen. You. So Ryan and Diana, uh, to build on Helen's introduction, um, in a minute or less, just tell us who you are. Uh, we'll start with Diana. So I am a 60-year-old trans woman. I am from New York City. Um, I'm an author. I was a longtime public school teacher. Now I teach freelance at colleges and programs and things. Um, I was also a professional dancer for a time and have trained um, mostly as a poet, as, as a writer, but I also do journalism and um, have been a magazine columnist. And then this, uh, this nonfiction book, this, this memoir, this body I wore, um, that's, that's about it. Okay. <laughs> Ryan? Uh, well, first of all, thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's it's kind of hard to put into words uh, how honored I am to be here and have this conversation because I feel uh, a little underqualified. I've worked as a birthday party clown. I've worked on a presidential campaign. I've worked in the Bronx as a teacher as well. I've worked as a sushi waiter. And then I went to Oxford trying to figure out how I can channel all of these interests into a realistic project and my 50 states of mind my book is sort of a culmination of all of my interests in politics in storytelling and in traveling so i've been to all 50 states and spoiler alert i fell in love with kansas city 
on the journey. And I moved here four years ago and live in Volker, the neighborhood of Volker on the KC Mo side. Very good. Um, Diana, welcome, welcome to the 60s. Uh, <laughs> it's an interesting passage, uh, I have to say. Um, and speaking of passages, I would like to invite each of you to read uh, a couple minutes uh, from each of your works. Um, we'll start with Ryan. Wow, okay. Uh, so I flipped through and I was trying to figure out a, a place to read and I thought I'd take everybody to Indianapolis, Indiana briefly. So this is 50 States of Mind, A Journey to Rediscover American Democracy, and we're going to Indiana. In Indianapolis, population 872,680, I visited the Harrison Center for the Arts, a community-based nonprofit arts organization that seeks to be a catalyst for renewal in the city. The founder, Joanna Beatty Taft, was an energetic woman who exuded an easy confidence as she gave me a tour of the premises and outlined how since its founding in 2001, what started as an arts organization to keep artists from abandoning the city became a vessel for community development. A Washington DC native, Joanna was cognizant of the fact that if she had stayed in a city oversaturated with talent, she would not have been able to accomplish half of what she had in Indianapolis, fighting through a crowd of do-gooders. The lack of red tape didn't hurt either, admitted Joanna, as she walked me through the studios of painters, printmakers, and sculptors. In a wide showroom, portraits of joyful-looking African-American seniors were painted in bright colors. Those are commissioned portraits of our great sheerarchs, she said, explaining that it had been a priority to give the neighborhood a sense of ownership over the center. At their hearts, all neighbors want to be known and loved. When you move to a neighborhood and ignore the history, people don't understand how hurtful that is. It's about knowing and loving that story and choosing to be a part of that story through the arts. I asked Joanna what it was about the arts specifically that was so impactful. I think we all tend to judge. I think when I meet people, I, I judge. Art has taught me to listen, to learn before I decide. I love the arts because I think it works on your heart. Joanna explained how she tried to live out community building principles in her daily life as well. When we first moved here, we had a front porch, but one of the first things we did when we moved in was put up a privacy fence because that's what you do in DC, she said. But now I porch every Sunday afternoon with my neighbors. The great triarchs come and spend time on my porch. We have all these traditions because we've been doing it so long. It's something that, that didn't happen in DC, which was more of a private backyard place. So I love that Indianapolis has brought me opportunity. It's brought me access. And it also has the amenities of a city, but it feels like a small town. And I think in our hearts, we all want to live in a small town. Hmm. Nice. Uh, Diana. Yeah, I, I, that was the passage I marked, <laughs> Ryan. <laughs> oh, good. I chose right. <laughs> do it. I, yeah. I'll read you this passage from uh, a chapter called The Fabric Factory. So, you know, what this body I wore does is it chronicles, um, among other things, a community of New York City cross-dressers in the 80s and 90s that are about to fade out of history, out of memory. And, um, and I was there for it. And, you know, you don't think you're there for history until maybe later and you look back and you're a little freaked out, as I was. So um, um, I'll just pick it up in the middle. And there are, um, there's language here that's old style and would be incredibly transphobic these days, but it was the only language we had. So you're going to hear words like TV, which is transvestite and TS, which is transsexual, um, verboten words. Um, the Fabric Factory Bar on West 41st Street has a dressing room in the basement for men who arrive in trousers and polo shirts carrying duffel bags and appear an hour later at the top of the stairs in gowns or skirt suits teetering in high heels like newborn cults. The most arrive already dressed as women. They come from as far as Pennsylvania and Massachusetts. They have shaved and prepped themselves all afternoon 
appropriated clothes from their wives' closets, snuck out to their cars at dusk, braved the stairs of highway toll takers, risk getting pulled over by troopers. By midnight, they have five o'clock shadows. I take the subway from Brooklyn. I'm safe on mass transit, I tell myself, as long as I go all out, like an actor who fully commits. Even if the material is flawed, people respect the effort. Some writers look at me, then look away. And those who don't look at me at all, well, that's even better. I dress like an ordinary woman coming from work. Most cross-dressers overdo it in some way. A crazy wig or garish makeup, a too tight outfit or stiletto slingbacks they can't manage. Not that I don't respect whatever turns them on. I just happen to be turned on by blending. I'd like with my first step inside the fabric factory to be seen as a woman who entered the wrong bar. And then there is this, this litany of different characters. And I'll just, I'll just finish with a couple other paragraphs from here. We come to the fabric factory like animals to water, whether we drink or not, whether we mingle or dance or sit alone in a corner, we are nourished every time we hear the pronoun she and realize it's us, there's a shock and shiver of life. We tell one another how we got through our week, the hiding, the purging, the fear, the thrill. Someone's wife was in tears, threatening to leave. Someone was spotted by a cop while getting dressed behind bushes in a vacant lot. We share our confusion. How can we love sports and car engine and also love this? How can we love women and also this? I consider myself a lesbian, says a large cross-dresser in a yellow prom dress. We talk about how we handle our families, those who have families, and church, those who attend. We trade advice on how to create cleavage, cover beard shadow, fill bras, tuck our genitals, what to tell our coworkers who ask about our nails. I play guitar, our long hair, I'm in a band, our shaved legs, I'm a cyclist or a swimmer, our tweezed eyebrows. I don't know what you're talking about. In the months since stepping out for the first time, I've been to nearly all the places they talk about, though there is nothing quite like the fabric factory, eclectic, warm, and welcoming. Like your first Little League field, it is both a home and a destination. A man can wander aimlessly in a city at night, but a lady needs a destination. During the week, garment district executives come here to drink their lunches, but every Saturday, the fabric factory is ours, and the disco ball in the middle of the ceiling shines its ever-receding facets on the faces of people we are 20 years away from having any respectable words for. Hmm. Both those passages, I think, really uh, very nicely encapsulate um, both works, actually. Um, and hopefully will lead, will lead, uh, folks to, to each title. Um, what compelled you both to want to tell these stories, Diana, you could have written more poetry, Ryan, you're a playwright. Um, why these stories in these structures, in these formats and why now, Diana? Um, well, I, I think, as I mentioned er, er, earlier, I was interested in the challenge of, well, both the need to memorialize a group that I hadn't before seen as worth writing about because I was part of it, maybe. Um, and also the challenge of writing about a time, you know, before there was proper language, um, which, which also meant a lot of the people couldn't see themselves. Most of the people I'm describing in this bar and in other places from that time were trans and didn't know it. And, you know, a lot of people are puzzled about, you know, how can you, how can that happen? How can you be so essentially something, a gender, and, and, and not know it? And I was also interested in the challenge of you know, writing about a trans childhood. I had a fully trans childhood, but I had no clue because of, you know, the world I was in, you know, both family and culture um, and time. 
So, you know, th that interested me. I, I didn't see a lot of people doing history from the point of view of a late transitioner. Mm -hmm. He knows about the early transitioners, the, um, you know, people, most history of trans, especially women, are about the performers the early transitioners, you know, with good reason, they were out, they were visible, but the late transitioners, you know, we were still, I think we are still kind of the iceberg under the water. And, mm -hmm. and maybe most, most of trans people are this way. We still don't know how many of us there are. Right. Ryan. I think this was sort of a search for meeting for me in the United States. I, had worked on the 2016 uh, Hillary Clinton campaign. And I thought I had the best job in the world because every day I got to wake up and talk to people in different communities, whether it was dairy farmers in Iowa or Haitian immigrants in Florida. And I felt so connected to the lifeblood of democracy because I was having conversations every day. And as soon as the campaign ended, I felt really isolated and I didn't know where to go to find out what the story of America was. I wasn't having real conversations anymore. And of course, I went to Oxford and left for the UK and American democracy wasn't my problem anymore uh, for about three days. And then I became obsessed with this idea of going back and having conversations with people on the ground because from what I saw in the news and my news feeds and social media feuds, I had a lot to be very concerned about and I had a lot to be upset about. And I'm a knee-jerk optimist, always trying to find the good in situations, trying to find the good in people. And it was really difficult for me to do that. So I thought, I'm going to hit the road and I'm just going to see who I meet. And I think I was definitely served well by the fact that my Oxford graduate program gave me so little money. I had like barely enough to get to Ohio, which is my first state out of 50. And so I had to stay in the homes of people across the country. And I think that was a really big turning point for me because like a lot of celebrities after the 2016 election would show up with a camera crew, have a hour long conversation and then go stay at a hotel somewhere else. Uh, I had to spend hours and sometimes days with people. And I found that the topics that we were covering in the first hour or so by the end of a visit would be about something completely different. And so it was definitely a journey about challenging my own preconceived notions about the country that I lived in. And I want to just go back to your comment about, about history and, and being a part of history. And I think, and uh, I think your particular volume is um, in a way, a history of, of, a, of a facet of a community and just an individual's um, engagement with that. And, and I think that kind of takes time to recognize that you have lived through um, what is now history, right? And like the fabric factory and the people there are gone. And uh, I see parallels of that um, in the way that uh, up donors to the archive that I oversee, the, the queer archive that I oversee, um, I see that that shift in perspective in in their uh, transition from taking their stuff and giving it to this archive. And it's it's just an interesting um, it's an interesting parallel in in your book. and and um, I just wanted to to make mention of that. Um, uh, yeah, so can, go I ahead pick up on that just for a moment. So I'm here at the Yado Arts Colony. Um, mm -hmm. State New York in Saratoga Springs. And the other night I was talking to a photographer, a very talented gay photographer who's interested in chronicling a drag queen and showed me a lot of photos of memorabilia arranged, some of which were photos within the photos. And he, he had this kind of need to chronicle this kind of lost world, you know, in that sense. And there was a romanticness that we had in common in terms of, you know, those enclaves that we found for ourselves, kind of like digging a home in the middle of a rock cliff where it was dangerous and yet there was adventure and excitement in the middle of it, kind of like, you know, the speakeasy type of culture. 
and yet I think it's where the red state legislatures, especially um, you know, supermajority red states, are trying to send you know queer people back to you know that kind of that kind of world. Um, and even though you know Ryan is this optimist, I really feel like there's a wrestling match going on in his book. You know about you know what do we do? I mean, how could you love living in a small town, which he dreams of? And you know, well, if that small town is in the wrong state, uh, it, it could easily be lethal. Again, right, or the wrong sets of neighbors. Mm. Yeah. Um, but building on that, uh, did writing each of your books change your relationship with hope in any way for yourselves, hope for your families, hope for the country, Ryan? I think that something I just got back from traveling to a bunch of different libraries and I would be in places like Wisconsin, places like rural Maine. And I always admit at those libraries that there are some days where I do not feel hopeful, where I see what's on the news and I see what's happening in communities across this country and I feel despondent. I feel like we are too far apart to ever listen to each other. And sort of my big takeaway from traveling around and talking to people is that the only tool in our arsenal to change people is storytelling is listening to other people's stories and expecting them to listen to yours as well. And, and I always want to make it very clear that, uh, cause I get a lot of pushback at these libraries that I'm not advocating for sitting down with your neighborhood extremist or anything like that. But what I love so much about Diana's book is how human it is. Uh, there's a passage about watching, you know, mom and, uh, I watched my mother and brother drive off together from the window of my room where I'd been sat earlier that day. Uh, she shifted into drive and headed off down Malvern Lane. The screams took on a purpose as though like some superhero, I could achieve a volume loud enough for them to hear to turn around and come back for me. And I think the reason that I have hope is that if we take the time to realize that everyone has a moment like that and we can we can go back to our childhoods and our upbringings and find the humanity that has been absolutely missing from all of the conversations in the political sphere right now. And that was what I got to experience on my journey. It was away from the news, away from people watching Fox News or, or whatever they're watching being fed certain talking points. And it came back to the common humanity where it's about the the job that ended or the the child who passed away. And when I found that I could start with common humanity with people. And when people actually took the time, which people don't do, uh, because we're all on social media or we're all, you know, just spouting talking points, that I found that people would listen and get through to each other. And I think in the context of all of the awful things that are going on, especially in state legislatures, which have happened after uh, this book was uh after this book was written and something I deal with every day working at the Trevor Project, which is a suicide prevention organization for young people. I come back to the only reason I can feel hopeful is that when we have conversations about common humanity, when we give people the opportunity to broaden each other's perspectives, I see that is where we can actually make a dent, uh, when we can actually change people's minds. Because if we stay, uh, if we stay like we are not listening to each other, nothing, nothing will ever change. And so it's, it's a choice. It's a choice to be hopeful and hoping that if we can tell our stories, listen to other people's perspectives, that maybe a change can happen. And, and sometimes, sometimes it does. And sometimes it's, it's a lost cause and it's trying to figure out which one is, uh, which case is which. What about you, Diana? What about hope for you? Um, I'm not as optimistic. Um, I, I love this country, but it's a body that has a disease. And I can't pretend that we don't have a disease. And that disease needs to be attended to. 
and uh, if you don't name the disease, you can't you can't go anywhere. You know, this is a fascist uh, takeover that is this taking place in our country, starting with uh, the state houses, as Ryan mentioned, and that's been going on for a while now in the state houses, frankly. Um, and uh, you know, you could you could you could tell stories and appreciate stories, but when that person goes to the poll and votes against your life, your ability to get, you know, life-saving health care, especially for, you know, a trans kid, let's just say, um, you know, your medical privacy, your bodily autonomy. Um, I'm not sure what the story did at that point in a country with a disease. Um, I think we maybe could come back to stories later, but what's going on with the disease is slogans. You know, fascism works with blunt slogans, just as Hitler recommended, and it's exactly what Trump does. And, you know, when I was a school teacher for 21 years, I feel like I presided over the shrinking of the American attention span. And um, we need better slogans. We need, um, we need to be really smart about turning the ship. And they, people don't have time for stories. Um, I don't know if that's going to affect votes at this point. I don't know if, you know, when they go low, we go high with our story. I, 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 no, I don't. I think it's too late for that, you know, from a certain point of view. Um, you know, I like the optimism. We need it. Um, but I, um, I never lose sight of this disease. You know, there, there's a, this passage that, that Ryan, he started in Ohio in this book, but he went back to Ohio for the Trump rally. And he did a little code switching and didn't reveal, you know, that he was gay to the people he was around. And it was an interesting passage. Correct me if I'm wrong, Ryan, but you know, you were looking for ways not to broad brush people. You're always looking for that. And you um, wanted to see the good in these people at the Trump rally. But, you know, you knew you couldn't come out as gay to them because you didn't know what would happen to you. So, you know, here you are trying to, you know, see the best in people. Meantime, you know, they could snuff you out if they knew who you actually were. Um, you know, that's a problem. You know, whose story gets to be told? I, I totally agree. And I think uh, this is one of the one of the my favorite things about having written a book is it's a journey and that realization that i have the privilege of code switching comes later i took this as a 26 year old man uh and i had a lot of reasons to need to be optimistic but i didn't ask myself why do i need to be optimistic and i never wrote about being gay ever. It was the scariest potential thing for me to put on the page. And this book, the fact that I even put personal essays in there from a different exercise was the scariest thing in the world to me. And I think having the realization that I have the privilege of code switch switching and naming it when I'm in Wyoming was part of that growth, coming to terms with the privilege and presenting an idea and then saying, well, here's everything that's wrong with that. Um, so I, I completely agree. And I think it comes back to what are we, what are we looking for ourselves? What voids are we trying to fill? And those are ultimately the things that I came back to. Why was I, you know, trying to defend a bunch of 40 year olds who look like the people that my parents grew up with, uh, in a very conservative town like Rockford, Illinois. Um, and I totally agree that we need people's attention spans are absolutely gone. And I agree with everything you're saying. I think the, the thing I come back to is I don't know what else to do except for talk to people in our communities and talk to people in our lives, because that's the only solution I have after traveling around. So the optimism is not national optimism. It's that, you know, the more we invest in the people around us, the more we 
you know, you know, part of the reason I wrote this book and put some of these really personal things about coming out in there uh, was I wanted someone who read and say, okay, this, this writer, you know, he's, you he can see the other side, but then they get to a passage where I'm talking about being gay and they want to throw the book away, but how do they, can they accept this part of me, but also this part of me? Cause I've had people come up to me and say, you know, I really like your book, but I don't know why you wrote about all that gay stuff in there. Like, why, why was that gay stuff? And I, I didn't like that. And that, that hurts because it's the part that is the most sensitive, tender part. Uh, but I don't think that you can throw away one part of someone, uh, even if they're trying to do the work of seeing your side. And I think that's sort of my, not penance, but going to that rally and not thinking about those things. By the end of the book, I, I realize I have to come to terms with those in order to have a clear eyed vision of America. Does that, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. oh, I think the book says, is America, is it safe to be gay in America? And in and some it, places. Yeah. At the end, it's like, I want, I really want to say yes, but you know, you're not in a small town, you're in Kansas city in the end. Yes. And the feeling of a small town, I think is what resonated with me. I mean, there's a reason I don't live in, uh, Arkadelphia, Arkansas. Uh, it's because queer people can't choose anywhere they want to live now. There, there is not that that ability, and we want to build that world. And this is the thing at the Trevor Project we always talk about. We want to build that bright future, and we keep looking towards it. But we know there's going to be a lot of battles in the in the interim. So I think that's sort of the looking towards the bright future, the optimism to be the fuel to get through the the awfulness of what what you're talking about right now this this awful political moment where people aren't thinking for themselves and they're taking talking points they're not actually taking the time to watch uh, a movie with a queer person to to read a book like this body i wore i i, I can i ask has anyone read this book where they came up to you and were like this changed my mind or some of your red state book events so yeah i'm doing a red state library tour. Um, so it's interesting that you've been to libraries in particular. We've, been, we've both been on de Tocqueville-esque visions. Yeah. <laughs> That's, you know, um, they haven't said it in, in, in so many words. They found themselves enjoying the story. And I agree. I mean, in a book, you know, you know, people do want a story. You've got them. You've got them if you, could, if you can keep them, if you can keep on the edge mm. of their you know, and they don't go off and make a cheese sandwich because they're reading your book. Um, but, you know, how much of America reads, you know, and, you know, who's going to sit down, you know, and, and, and spend that time. Um, you know, when I go around to libraries, I'm, I'm mostly getting so far um, people who, you know, want libraries to succeed and they they want these attacks to stop and they want the freedom to read um except for pella iowa pella iowa has had some hideously transphobic incidents recently and the librarian is a lesbian person who has been attacked publicly why because she's a lesbian person you know like it's really bad in pella desantis has been there twice already you know he he butters his bread in pella iowa um and outside the library, when I entered where, you know, kind of church lady types with these warnings about, you know, they knew about the event, even though the librarian uh, didn't publicize it to the last minute. It was a whisper campaign among the queer community and allies of Pella. But then the room was packed. It was absolutely packed. I think there were a lot of allies wanted an occasion for solidarity. And this was a good one in their view, you know, to come there. Um, I don't know what minds my book may be changing. I, I happen to think, you know, there's a trans woman named Amy Schneider, who is the famous Jeopardy, was it Schneider? Uh, who's the great Jeopardy champion, who's this trans lady who was just a completely ordinary person, not flamboyant, not anything, you know, she was like this model of just boring normalcy who happened <laughs> to be fantastic <laughs> and, and impeccably polite and gracious on America's favorite show. And suddenly these grandmas watching Jeopardy started to have conversation with their trans grandchildren because they were big fans of Amy Schneider. <laughs> you know, I think 
that kind of thing changes people because now we're in the living rooms and they're rooting for us, you know, in, in, in that way. Um, so it, it's hard to tell, you know, what will change a mind. I know more about what would shift an independent mind, mm. you know, a, a voter. I mean, I'm thinking very pragmatically um, and just in terms of the electorate and, you know, staving off, um, you know, this kind of creeping fascist plurality, you know, that's far more organized than any liberal bunch of storytellers. They're incredibly organized. You know, what Hillary gave up was Obama's ground game. She thought she could win with Obama's electorate, but she didn't have his ground game. You know, mm. Bill, Bill was dying for her to go into the rural places and she wasn't listening. I mean, you couldn't have two politicians more different than Bill and Hillary in a sense. And, um, you know, I, we need some kind of ground game. <laughs> Well, and I think um, as someone who's in, who's mired constantly in queer history, I think that's where we turn uh, for guidance is uh, the lessons from those who came before who were encountering different types of fascism and different and far more extreme types of oppression. And how did those individuals come together and and overcome some of the obstacles that were placed in front of them because you know oppression is a pendulum it swings one direction and then it'll swing back over time and uh it's how how it's it's looking at the past to figure out how do we get the pendulum moving back in the other direction um because this this isn't the first group of fascists who've attacked this community. Um, there was a very 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 similar group uh, forty years ago, um, when the, uh, when we when we were in the midst of the AIDS crisis, and um, definite steps were taken to address the the actions by those individuals, and of course the difference is now. Um, you have to get out from behind your screen in order to to have an impact, I think. Um, people ask me all the time when I do presentations, what can we do? And that's my first advice is get out from behind your screen and get in front of someone so that they see the individual who is impacted by their actions. Um, they, they can put a face with, with the oppression uh, because 99 times out of 100, um, the people you're talking to on the screen are people who agree with you already. So uh, that's why I find it imperative to, to, to be somewhere and be a presence physically uh, just so that, uh, so that people can see who's being affected by all this crap. Um, so in, in your works, um, what answers did you find in both of them and what questions did you find you didn't know you had? As, as you finish these works. I mean, Diana. when I think about this body I wore, I, I didn't know the, sh the, the contours of its relevance. I thought it'd be interesting, you know, for non-trans people particularly. Usually trans people don't need to hear about another person's transition story. They have their own. Right. Uh, the, the publisher didn't understand that. Um, uh, and so I thought it would be just a good piece of history. I want to tell a good story. And then suddenly it becomes relevant as kind of the world that MAGA wants to send us back to. Only this time there are laws, it's being legislated, you know, which is a little more like, I think the, the gay community faced historically was legislation, you know, right. laws against, you know, what, who they were and, you know, what, what they would want to do with their lives. Um, I, uh, I don't know. I, I don't know exactly how to answer, you know, what answers it gives me other than that if it causes more people to come out, you know, this this beautiful thing Harvey Milk said, I believe it was the 70s. I could be wrong. You know, we got to come out. We've mm -hmm. come out as much as we can, as soon as we can, 
and and everyone thought it was you know kind of you know conservative or reactionary and it was radical because he he was smart i mean he knew the allies would come out if we came out and i think uh i think rallying the allies is just so important especially for trans people because because we're a fraction of the the size of the gay population and the most promising thing I've seen on my red state library tour is the number of allies, the number of people who come mm-hmm. up to me to talk to me or to sign a book, just to talk, whatever they come up and they talk about their cousin, their, their, their trans sister who attempted suicide and, and, um, and thank God they didn't succeed, but now they're alive and aging and whatever, um, their kid, their questioning. Kid, I mean, all over the place, uh, I'm seeing, you know, I'm seeing, I think the number of trans allies has probably now equaled the number of trans people, perhaps. I don't know how you measure that, but I get the sense of that. And I think when that happened with uh, PFLAG, you know, historically with Jean Manford, what, I mean, what a, what a hero she was. When that number, the number of gay allies equaled the number of gay people, and then it, then it topped that. I think there was a shift there too. Those are voters. Right. It's a tipping point. I think so. Yeah. Ryan, what about you? I think the big question for me was how do you make an impact at a time where American political discourse is in an awful polarized place where no one can have a real conversation about what's going on and I think my main answer that I came away with is that our canvases have to be our communities, uh, that we can show up at local organizations, support local organizations, put ourselves in situations where we can, like you said, put a face to an abstract political movement and or an abstract political issue. And I think if we look at the these communities as arenas to make change we won't feel so despondent either it won't feel futile because if we use social media as a conduit to get us in person to gather with people to you know show up in our community meet people from different perspectives different backgrounds and then keep showing up keep showing up in our neighborhoods showing up on our neighborhood boards showing up at protests getting involved with our city councils because here in Kansas and Missouri, Lawrence just passed a uh, a safe haven ordinance for for trans people. Uh, same with Kansas City, Missouri. That was the result of pressure locally from people that are in these states. Like, what the hell is going on? This is this is not right. This is ridiculous. And if people only looked at the national issue, then we wouldn't have shown up to to actually make that happen. And I think. That's the main answer for me. It's like the the things that are around us, we can have some sort of control on, and maybe that will create ripple effects in the news. People will see what's happening in one town and say, well, why don't we have that here? They made it happen in Lawrence. Maybe it can happen in DeSoto, Kansas. Uh, But my question is, and this goes back to the days that I don't feel hopeful, uh, how do you get people off of social media and get them to engage and in real, in real organizing. Uh, I think there's this feeling, especially among young people that if you share the post or if you make the Instagram story that you've, that you've done your, that you've done your work. uh, But we live in these echo chambers and I think it takes getting brave and, and showing up uh, as an ally, uh, as a queer person and actually, and actually trying to make the the community better. And it also means showing up in other organizations and building goodwill. Um, We were at the, uh, the pride event here in Kansas city for Kansas city, big brothers and sisters. And it was amazing. The number of people that came up and said, I didn't know I could be a big, I didn't know that this was allowed for me. I didn't know that I would be accepted. And I think that's where you, you meet the family and the family maybe changes their mind, or maybe you, you meet the kid who is, who is also going through something similar, or you, or you meet the the little league team that the kid is on, and I think that's the really hard, scary thing, and especially especially for trans people in Missouri, uh, and especially for people of color in in Missouri who are queer. But 
I think that those are the little steps we can take to feel less despondent, to create a grassroots network of people that will show up for each other. And how do you get people to do that uh, all over? That's what I'm still struggling with. Sure. Um, so Jeanette Wall said that the best self-help books are memoirs. What, uh, if anything, did you learn about yourselves while writing your books? Diana? I think uh, the journey of writing that surprised me was the amount of grief that came up. That really? had always been bottled. Yeah, I couldn't believe the grief. I, I mentioned it at the beginning of the, uh, the epilogue. Um, it was an understatement. <laughs> hmm. That's all I have to say. I said to my therapist at the time, I said, um, can feeling grief be traumatizing? She says, of course. <laughs> what are you joking? It was just, I, didn't, I thought grief was a good thing. You feel grief, you grieve. She goes, no, no, it's, it can be, you know, it was very overwhelming to me. Um, I, you know, I had kind of been optimistic, I think, in my life, even at the worst moments. I just am someone who's just optimistic, um, uh, maybe as a survival mechanism. And that whole time, you know, writing about it, you kind of go there. And I, I saw through a much clearer lens how much trouble I was in, how much life I lost. You know, what they say, the best years of your life. I didn't have a chance at the best mm -hmm. years of my life, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and I just had to feel everything, and I couldn't believe how much there was to feel. And, you know, it still comes over me. Um, enormous grief. I think ultimately it's, it's, it stems from the childhood stuff. You know, always the children. I mean, not having a childhood in your gender it's not on any of the catalogs of oppression or suffering, but not to have a childhood in your gender is something that people who are not trans can't even fathom or imagine. Mm -hmm. It's something that people who are trans can't, can't not see, you know, like we, we, we don't know what it is. No trans adult I know knows what it is to have had a childhood in your gender, to have gone through a puberty that was not terrifying physically, you know, um, experientially. And, you know, and all that follows from that, you know, j just, just in terms of your stability, your grounding as, as, as a human, you go through a life crisis and suddenly your very basis of identity comes up again and again and again. A friend of mine said, one of my beta readers, my, a trans friend named Thea, a very smart woman, a chess player, in fact, she just said being trans bumps up against everything. Now, that was wise, the way she put it. That, that's what stunned me is just the amount of grief just felt lethal at times. Mm -hmm. What about you, Ryan? I think I learned the mistake of trying to separate the personal experiences from the political ones and how quickly they start to crash down. Um, one of the things that I just found so moving about this body I wore was how much it was about the relationships in your life, your, your family, your friends, uh, your lovers, that one of the most powerful things for me uh, was where you included what people wrote in your high school yearbook, you going back and looking for clues about who you were or trying to piece together these relationships. And I think I've always sort of thought like, okay, I need to get over what happened in my childhood. Why am I writing about high school? Uh, <laughs> but these things really profoundly affect us. And I think that's, uh, I think this book was a pathway for me to start writing about some of those more interesting, serious things, because you just worry about protecting everyone, or at least that's something that, that I did. I, I'd show manuscripts to people and say, is anyone going to be mad at me for this? Is anyone <laughs> get, is anyone going to like, 
and and inevitably people were mad even the people that i was trying the hardest to to protect the lady in alabama is like um i really feel like i came across as like trying too hard or token i'm like well i'm just trying i'm just trying to please everyone this. and i think it was this big takeaway that sometimes being honest means that it's it's gonna piss people off or it's gonna bring up something uh, which is what I was trying to avoid. And ultimately, you can't write a, a brave, interesting, moving piece of writing until you actually uh, put that in there. So even like, this book gave me courage. It really gave me so much courage. I was just like, oh, like, you can paint a picture with one sentence. It's that poet sensibility that I'm like, oh, I just, I it was a master class for me. So uh, I feel like I had a, a journey reading your work as well. You know, Ryan, when, when you met, if I can, when you mentioned the, um, you know, the yearbook, I also think about your prom memory. I mean, you know, uh, looking for an exit ramp, you know, and that prom became part of your closet in a sense. Um, you know, can I have this cocoon around me? You know, will I always need a cocoon around me? And I really related to that a lot. I mean, my exit ramp was kind of the, um, you know, that last relation. I was looking for that exit. Do I really have to do this? Do I really have to transition? Do I really need to step into a life that's going to be this dangerous, this fraught with with peril? You know, and that's national as well. Yeah. You know that that old feminist, uh, you know, maximum that the personal is political. Uh, that I always used to hear in college. People used to spout that. You know, knee jerk. And I just thought that was, you know, that's ridiculous. We have a word personal for a reason. Some things, <laughs> are, some things, some things are personal. That's why we have the word personal. But, you know, when you're a minority, um, you see, you know, it, it is very political just, for, just to be in a place that, a culture that can hold you. You know, with some degree of, life is always going to be dangerous. That's part of life itself. But it's that extra stuff, the hate crime stuff you know, it makes your personal life political. Mm. The political that is imposed on your existence by forces beyond your control. Absolutely. Yeah. You're not looking for politics. You're just right. looking for a good night out, um, right. a kiss, you know, holding hands with a friend, a, you know, just what most people take for granted. So I'm curious about your other literary efforts um, in poetry, Diana, and in plays, Ryan, and if they may be informed or how they might be informed by these two works. You're first, Ryan. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, so my plays that I write are horror plays about institutional abuse about families that can never come together again uh, because of politics or estrangement. So I'm not always this optimistic in my writing. And I feel like um, some of the verisimilitude that I encountered across the country in small towns, there were things that scared me. There were things that I thought were interesting and I wanted to mine. And I, I think I almost feel safer mining those questions through plays, through through characters for other people to inhabit and explore. Um, so I definitely think traveling across the country and just the, the division that exists and how it trickles down into our families and how family trauma stays with us. And now how we have more that divides us. There are more issues to make us estranged from each other besides just money and favoritism and sex and abuse and all the things we go through. Um, so I think I definitely channel some of the, the darker, less optimistic views into my, my plays. And I, uh, yeah, I don't know, maybe I need to start to less compartmentalize less, but over to you, Diana. <laughs> well, you know, you do have a pension for ghost stories. I mean, in the middle of, of these, uh, this journey, these little, you know, sort of, uh, you know, thumbnail portraits of different states and different people and scenes, you have these, these, um, you know, sort of dark horror, you know, events, several of them. One takes place in a cemetery of all places. You know, you got the truth and consequences thing. I mean, you have a penchant for, you know, just that narrative, 
you know, good horror story. <laughs> wow, right. I am, I'm was, blushing. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it was true. <laughs> me too. <laughs> I mean, as for me, I have always been a generalist. I kind of write whatever I want. It doesn't tend to be fiction. Um, uh, right now, I'm you know working on a couple long form essays. One about a medical experience I had, and another about uh, uh, basically a cult, uh, a Buddhist cult. And I'm, I'm really interested in spiritual abuse in non-theistic situations, which has not been written about a lot. Um, at the same time, you know, I'm kind of at the ready to, you know, write an op-ed, write a column, take a look at, you know, if I have something to say that no one else is saying, I'm going to do it. Um, but I'm, I'm, I try to be careful and mindful. If it's already been said, they don't need me to pile on. You know, we don't need more light pollution. Um, so, you know, a couple of months ago, I had something to say about libraries that I didn't see anyone else saying, not quite. And, you know, I, I looked for the reddest state and the best paper to do it, which was the Tampa Bay Times. And that's where I announced, you know, the library tour. <clears throat> and I might write a couple pieces. Just I'm, I'm on break from the tour here at Yado, but I'm going back to it in September. And I might write some dispatches from the tour about what I'm seeing. Um, so, um, yeah, no particular agenda, which, you know, I'm, I'm just working at different things. I'm also trying to finish up a poetry um, collection. And, you know, the poems don't seem to have a pattern until a critic names it, but I'm not I'm not worried about right. Right. You know, that kind of thing. I, I'm just, I guess I'm just trying to be a writer in the world. Um, you know, I think the publicist, the publicist at presses, I mean, this came out with a big press, this came out with FSG. But these publicists, um, you know, they're given a lot of books and a lot of work. And, and I realized, you know, what I could do is just be a writer in the world and just go about my way <clears throat> and, and just, um, you know, see, see, see what kind of mischief I can, you know, the good trouble of John Lewis. Well, uh, we're about at the end of our time and we look forward to the mischief that you both can get into as we move forward. And, uh, as new works come out, we really look forward to them because these two works, uh, were absolutely compelling and, uh, very interesting to read together, uh, I, I would just say. Um, two very different journeys, but uh, uh, two parallel journeys, I would also say. So thank you, Ryan, and thank you, Diana, for uh, a wonderful conversation. Thank, thank you, Thank you, Diana. Thank you, Helen. All right. Thank you all for being here. Uh, before we go, I want to let everyone know that we'll also be recording uh, a lecture with Diana around this body I wore. It will also be available on Library On Demand. She will also um, be providing a workshop via Zoom on Saturday, September 30th from 9 to 11 Central Standard Time. And Ryan will be on faculty at our uh, 2023 Writers Conference the first weekend in November. So we're very excited. Um, and so thank you everyone who's watching and thank you all for being here. And uh, we'll see you later. <laughs> <laughs>